Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Look how old you are now. Wow, you used to be this big. Now you're this tall. <laughs> the following readings are from the Bible and the Bhagavad Gita. Each week we read from both scriptures as prescribed by Yoganandaji and by his guru, Sri Yukteswarji, who was guided by Babaji to compare the two scriptures to show the same underlying truths between them. This week is entitled, First Things First. This is a reading from Rays of the One Light by Swami Kriyanandaji, based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. That expression, first things first, is a piece of counsel often given to students of business techniques. It is the, adv the advice of practicality to those who aspire to worldly success. But according to the hermetic doctrine, as above, so below, that, sh that which works best, sorry, <laughs> that which works best on one level of life is often the best guide to what will work best on every other level. If a person is true to his highest priorities, he will generally find that his other needs are fulfilled naturally as well. Normally I have my reading glasses, so I'm happy <laughs> hard time. This is true, certainly, of the search for God. One of the greatest sayings of Christ was the simple sentence in this uh, passage, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Paramahansa Yogananda gave his elder brother Ananta a wonderful lesson in this truth. It was Ananta who had captured him and brought him back from his flight to the Himalayas described by Yoganandaji in Autobiography of a Yogi. In Yogananda's book, we read how Ananta later challenged him in the city of Agra to put his divine uh, faith against such practical worldly considerations as the need for earning a living. Fearless before the challenge, the young aspirant agreed to go by train without any money to the nearby town of Brindaban, not to miss a single meal in Brindaban and to find his way back to Agra without begging and without in any other way asking for help. In one of his most thrilling chapters in the book, Yogananda fulfilled all the conditions of the test. Yogananda continued the account. As the tale was unfolded, my brother turned sober, then solemn. The law of demand and supply reaches into subtler realms than I had supposed, Ananta spoke with a spiritual enthusiasm never before noticeable. I understand for the first time your indifference to the vaults and vulgar accumulation of the world. Late as it was, my brother insisted that he recover, that he received diksha, initiation, into Kriya Yoga. As the Bhagavad Gita puts it, those who worship lesser gods go to their gods, but those who worship me come to me. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Om, Om. This reading is from Whispers from Eternity, Paramahansa Yogananda's book of prayer poems. This one is entitled, Make us transparent that thy light may shine through us unimpeded. The sunbeams of thy love shine equally on all the members of thy cosmic family, whether prophet, hero, villain, tiny moth, or me. It is our own fault if we make ourselves opaque by our own mental and emotional dullness. Teach us to wipe away the dirt of error from the windows of our understanding. Our arms are weak for the task, owing to our long inner spiritual resistance. O oh, Master Cleanser, lend power to our efforts that we may wipe away every last spot that clings to our minds, obscuring our transparency and preventing free entry to thy light. Oh, make us fully clean again, invisible in our egos, because transmitting only visions of thy beauty, 
which lies within us. This advice, first things first, is, as Swamiji writes, often uh, a principle taught in business schools or uh, to those aspiring to business success. And the, the first thing uh, often refers to money, which is to say profit, the bottom line. And Swamiji said that uh, in a course that he wrote for those, uh, it's called Material Success Through Yoga Principles, how to live a dharmic life and also manifest things, live and operate in this world. We have to live and operate in this world anyway, and so why not do so in a dharmic way? Why not do so in a way that relates to our spiritual path? And he wrote this based on his own experience of having built the Ananda communities along with, of course, many other people, but guided and inspired by him. And many of the things he wrote we said, I mean, much of what he wrote, we said, we've never heard you speak about these things. And he said, I've never thought about these things, or I've never put them into words. And another thing he said was, well, this is what I was doing the whole time. I just found now is the time to express it. So it's a very important course. And there's a, a, a lesson, the course is 26 lessons, entitled First Things First. And Swamiji said, I have always felt that rather than make my bottom line money, I made my bottom line peace of mind. And he said, if something that I was working on was conflicting with my peace of mind, I would step back, reevaluate it, drop it, or get back to peace of mind and then approach it fresh. And he gives many uh, steps and suggestions for how to do this. But it's such a wonderful bottom line to keep in mind. Because, I mean, why do so many people seek money? It's for either security or success, so that then they will have peace of mind. You see, yeah, then I don't have to be afraid, but somehow it's, you know, anyway, I won't explore that, that thought further. Or, then I will have succeeded until I get hungry again for more. But it's that peace of mind, because that desire creates a pinch and then when that desire is fulfilled, we unpinch and then, oh, I feel such peace of mind or peace of hand in this case, releasing that pinch of flesh. So Swamp Master even defined worldly happiness or worldly pleasure in that way, that we put a condition on our happiness thinking I need that in order to be happy. And then when that condition is fulfilled, then we are happy again. But it is our nature not only to be happy, but our nature is happiness, God's joy, as we were saying in the affirmation. So, this is a helpful thing to keep in mind also. You could say, well, that's the spiritual teaching. As Master said once in a class, he said, well, if you tell people this, they will say, well, the Swami says so, meaning Master says so. But it's not just that, it's truth. And it's not truth because it's in the Upanishads only or the Rig Veda. It's true because you see it bear out. Every uh, sort of business-minded person I know who has reached a certain age, by the end of their lives, they're usually saying, what I would like is peace. My, I have an older relative or head in Kerala. He was very much material-minded, and uh, he's, he was also uh, an expert at shouting. If there was sort of a, an Olympic sport, he would definitely at least get the silver, if not the gold. And so we all sort of were, you know, as tends to happen when someone shouts, everyone else kind of tiptoes around them or sort of sees, okay, what's the mood today? And, you know, what's the weather like? And how short is the fuse? Ah, too late. And so we would sort of approach him that way. And every now and then he would smile and oh, we'd be relieved. Um, actually, Master's brother said it was the same thing with Sri Yukteswar, <laughs> when Shri, when, which I'm not at all comparing my relative to. But he said when Sri Yukteswar would arrive at Master's house, all the children would come and look and sort of see the look on his face. <laughs> and uh, if he reached into his pocket and he had candy, then they were happy and they could relax. So this, uh, this uncle of mine said, if you gave me a ticket to the U.S., I would not go, which was sort of his... Uh, way of saying I'm not interested in those kinds of things. He said, what I want 
is peace. And that I don't have. And it was the only sort of candid moment, the candid conversation we ever had. And I felt, I felt of course, a compassion and a sadness for him. He would read the Gita uh, in the, at the end of his life. That's what he focused on. And I, I knew he hadn't necessarily sought that for self sort of benefit or spiritual reasons earlier, perhaps for cultural, but he was seeking it now, reading it now, seeking peace. And others I've met, they sort of had their success, sa satiated their appetite enough, and then said, okay, but now I want peace. So it, it leads itself in its own natural way anyway, meaning everyone will get to that conclusion one way or another. And it's not anything we have to worry about except as applies to ourselves. So it's a good rule when you're looking at anything. Ask first, okay, how does this affect my inner peace? Now if you say, well, I'm in the bed, and the bed is very comfortable, and if I had to get out of the bed, it would affect my inner peace. So <laughs> I think that, yeah, <laughs> and uh, Chai and Idli, please. You know, it, well, it, it starts out fine at first, but then you notice everyone's a little bit upset or irritated or also the bills come and they need to be paid. And so we have to gauge the right level of inner peace. The thing is, you, inner peace means peace from inside that is not dependent on outside. Because we can always look for outer peace. And that's fine for a while. It comes and goes. But that kind of peace is uh, not useful. There was one woman who uh, uh, complained to Swami Kriyananda. She said, my husband said to me yesterday that here it is, you're on the spiritual path, you're meditating, you're trying to like improve yourself, and you're always worried, always nervous. And I have my television, and I have my beer, and I am always happy. And she said, and Swamiji, it's true. <laughs> she said, what do I say? And, 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 and Swamiji said, well, give it time. He said, the kind of peace he's enjoying is dependent on things going well. What happens if the TV runs out? What if the beer runs out? <laughs> Other things too. We're looking for a kind of peace that doesn't depend on things going a certain way for us to feel that peace. And it's, you can talk about it, you can teach techniques for it. The other great benefit is that we saw Swamiji had that peace. Not only we observed him and said, I bet he's feeling peaceful. And that face looks like a peaceful face. So it wasn't an inference, it wasn't a deduction, we felt it from him. You feel it from the photographs of he, from Master, you see it in their videos. You can feel that peace coming from them, just that calmness can be very excited, very animated, not just, don't bother me, I am feeling peace. You know, hey, shh, I'm feeling peace. <laughs> you know, it was, again, it, the, in fact, the Swamiji described and Master described the difference between peace and calmness. Peace is when we return to that inner state of stillness, and calmness is when we then enter back into life from that point of peace, radiating that peace. You could think of calmness as peace in motion, peace in action. Again, acting from that peace, more of a positive in the sense of radiating uh, and sharing that peace with others. And so, of course, then we look at this uh, statement of first things first, and we have to ask ourselves on the spiritual path, well, what what are the first things first as applied to the spiritual path? Again, as Swamiji said, the need to be practical, the need to follow, find the laws that govern success and follow them, that applies on every level of reality. Master said this in his uh, book. Um, the, I guess it's The Law of Success is the new title. There was another, another title originally, but The Law of Success. And that law, again, applies on every level. Concentration, putting out energy, you know, having courage, all you can say a number of things. But on the spiritual path, I would say one of the first things that's essential is to be interested. That's really the first step. I was speaking to someone uh, just yesterday, Prasanna and I were talking to someone who was contemplating discipleship. And she said, before this, I was just sort of living my life, you know, doing the things we do, working, thinking about money and my family and so on. And she said, 
coming to uh, uh, Ananda, doing the meditation, something sort of grew in me, or I don't remember exactly the word she used, but something in me awakened, is what I would say, that, uh, that made me see reality beyond just that life, just, you know, looking right in front of me all the time. And it wasn't that it replaced the other, it wasn't that her view changed, it expanded, it broadened to include a greater reality. And I said, well, that's, that's wonderful for you, we're so glad to hear it, but remember, you know, she, she didn't say this, but I wanted to clarify, it is not that these teachings, these techniques, gave you that, but rather they awakened that which was already within you, or you reconnected. In other words, to have a conversation, to mix the metaphor, you need to be speaking and listening. And so even if Master is speaking, it's also a part of us that listens, that hears, that recognizes. As Swamiji said, a teaching, a truth cannot be taught, it can only be recognized. In other words, there's something in us that says, yes, yes, that's true. And how do we get that? Lifetimes and experience. And so, first of all, we should be very grateful that we have that in ourselves, that recognition, that sense of, yes, this makes sense. Yes, this is the truth. This is what I want to follow. Because that most essential ingredient, that step one of spiritual teaching, cannot be taught. Swamiji said it's the most frustrating aspect of teaching <laughs> in that the most essential things you can't teach. People just either have it or they don't. And one simple way to define that is not, I mean to expand on that, is not worthiness or readiness, but interest. Just interest. Swamiji was talking to a relative of his, trying to, who in various ways Swamiji was trying to encourage him to be open to spiritual truths. And this man was a very intelligent person and sort of an academic, a professor. But uh, at one point he said to Swamiji, you know it all may be true what you say, but I'm just not interested. And that was, that was where the conversation therefore had to pause until he became interested. So again, we should prize, value our own interest, be grateful because that you developed yourself. You, over lifetimes, you, if you want to think of it as God's grace, it is in a way in the sense that you attracted that grace, but it isn't in the sense that it's just random. Someone asked Master of that. They, re they had read in a book that, uh, they, or they had heard, they said, Ramakrishna said that grace is just sort of the, the whimsy of God, that he may choose to just bless someone because he feels like it, and not another because he doesn't feel like it. And Master said, tell him that I said Ramakrishna would never have said that. He said, of course that's not true. It's, you, it, it's available equally to all, like the sunshine, when we get the sunshine. We got a lot of rain, too. I guess that's available equally to all, too, when it lands on our heads. But again, we have to open ourselves to it. And, so, and everybody can. And remember, everybody will in time, as we have merged, as we have sort of emerged from God, we will eventually, lifetime after lifetime, finally merge back into him, every one of us. And so we don't have to worry too much about others. Once we are clear on our first priority, our second priority is not to tell everybody about our first priority <laughs> or to tell them what their first priority ought to be. In fact, it should be the same. It's just not worth it and it doesn't work. And in fact, it can do harm because it can give them a sour taste in their mouth, sort of, yeah, 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 I know, and then, uh, you know, leave me alone. And then when later they might be open to it, uh, someone says, oh, you should try meditation. Don't talk to, I've already, you know, <clears throat> I'm still coughing from the last time it was sh uh, shoved down my throat. So we should be tentative. We should see if there's an opening and see if people are interested. And also think of their need to hear something rather than our need to say it. On the other hand, of course, it's natural to want to talk about things that are most important to us, most precious to us, to share, in that, en to share that enthusiasm with others. So step one, step one, find others who are enthusiastic. <laughs> in other words, don't sort of erupt your enthusiasm all over someone else. Just find people who are already enthusiastic. 
and then share with them. It's much easier and there's much more of an exchange among friends, similarly minded people, like-minded people, as Master said, and you can, you can, people may be interested in what you have to say and they will have interesting things to say too. So I'm not saying that we should suppress that need, I'm saying be appropriate. Find the right group, obviously, the spiritual community to share with, and do because then it satisfies that desire. And then when we're mixing in other circles where the interest is zero or less, then we can just say, oh, it's okay. I, I, I have my friends who I talk to. You can always use the telephone too midweek, you know, at any time. Just connect, connect with Swamiji on YouTube. He's there 24 hours a day waiting for you to click. And so, just um, satisfy that need so then we can sort of, we can have that unpinch of our own spiritual desire, fulfillment, and then we'll be at peace and we won't be too worried about, yes, but I need that from you. Well, we don't need it from anybody. Or if we do, we need it from God. We need it from Master. All of our eagerness to be closer to someone is really an eagerness to be close to God. I'm not denying the human level, it has its place. But remember, behind that always is God, and that closeness is always available. God is never too busy for you. God is never ill. You know, he's never unavailable. He's always there. And so we then can look at on the spiritual path, as I was saying, on this spiritual path, what, first things first, what are some of the fundamentals? It's very straightforward on one level, you could say, of Yoganandaji's teachings that his students, his disciples, one thing they do is meditate. And uh, the meditation techniques we practice are uh, energization exercises, not strictly a meditation technique, but you could sort of argue, uh, at the very least, a pranayama, and they should be done with a meditative spirit, which is to say, with an inner awareness of the energy. It's not just, look what I can do. I did this once, I think I've told this, but not in a long time, so I was uh, uh, waiting for a train in Boston to, to get onto it, and I decided that I really needed to do energization, and I was feeling a little shy, and I remembered, you know, Master energizing in Boston, same city, with Dr. Lewis, and Dr. Lewis was feeling shy, and Master, you know, uh, anyway, it's a whole story of how he was trying to help him get over his embarrassment. He said, people look at you strangely only because they don't do it. And so if, you, of course, you walk into a room full of uh, devotees and you start energizing, they'll know exactly what you're doing and it'll be perfectly fine. Anyway, so I reasoned that if I closed my eyes, then no one could see me. <laughs> and so I was energizing and as I was doing it, I was, I was getting you know, into it. And by the time I started doing this one, I became aware of a presence to my side. I don't know exactly how, but I opened my eyes and it was a police officer. <laughs> and he saw me and he said, are you getting ready to take off? <laughs> you know, sort of. And Do you want to say it in the Boston accent? I don't know if I can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you getting ready to take off? I can't, I can't pull it out. Yeah, maybe New York. <laughs> but um, yeah, and I, I did not have the centeredness. I just said, no, no. <laughs> and so um, the uh, energization exercises, Hong Sa, the Om technique, and Kriya. These are, you could say, the, the, uh, the core part of Yoganandaji's teachings of our spiritual path. They're not the only part because there's also how to live, spiritual living, living according to these principles. There's so much. Swamiji said there's so much more than meditation on the spiritual path, but the great gurus always emphasize meditation because it's the one thing that people struggle with most of all. And so, I mean, you hear these uh, disciples saying to Lahiri Mahashai that after all this work and fulfilling my duties and family and social responsibilities, what time is left for God? You know, it's just too busy. 1862, that conversation. Too busy. I mean, <laughs> think about it. We're almost at, or not almost at 2062, but we can think that, yeah, I might make it. 
you know, 200 years later, and it's like they didn't have phones going beep, beep in the middle of everything. They didn't have all this. They were busy. It is just Maya. And as I said, in 200 years, what's it going to be? Oh, I have to take my flying saucer to the repair shop. Somebody banged into it at warp speed. You know, it's all going to be the same thing. And so it's, and it's also the same God. So let's get to that God. Then you can fly your flying saucer happily, but with God. And so also we have at Ananda one huge principle of masters. Because you could say, I mean, yoga teachings... Are, it's teaching union with God and all these different uh, spiritual paths and even within yoga teachers are more or less sharing the same truth, which of course is true. That statement is true, but teachers give different emphases according to, first of all, the needs of the time that they're in, because they come at different times, but also the needs of their disciples or the particular group they're trying to reach. For one thing, Master said that uh, uh, people of this world were crying out for a technique to find God. Of America, he said they had techniques for everything, business and, and of course, you know, technology, all these things, but they wanted a technique for uh, spirituality, for religion, for finding God also, which of course India has developed over millennia. And so that uh, that need, that desire for, show me what I can do. So I'm not just reading about it, I'm not just hearing about it, but I'm experiencing it. Experience is key. Sometimes people argue about uh, science versus religion. Swamiji said the real debate is between belief versus experience. You can be just as dogmatic about science without having experienced the truths of it yourself. And you notice the great scientists never are that way, partly because they remember when things got, you know, toppled on their heads. We used to think this, now we think this. Maybe in 10 years we'll think something else because we're always wanting to know the truth underlying uh, reality, the truth of what, which we don't determine by our opinions. And so Master said, uh, speaking of this phrase of belief, sometimes there's this phrase used in religion that you should be dyed in the wool, which is to say that you, you, you convert someone to your line of thinking, or we all agree that we are you know, in this belief together, and that sort of makes it more true, because so many of us agree. And uh, Master said, we want to dye people in the wool of Kriya Yoga, and he said, Kriya Yoga will dye them in the wool of their own experience. It's not belief at all. It's not conversion at all. It's not numbers. It's you practice this, see what it does for you, and that will be enough. If it works for you. Of course, it works for those who are open to it, interested, all these other things I've been talking about. But still, that we should remember that too, as let's, did I dye myself in the wool of Kriya this morning, this afternoon, this evening? Even, you know, at any time, just, oh, I'm feeling off. Let me sit and meditate and get centered. Especially if you have Kriya, do Kriya. If you don't have Kriya, do one of the other techniques. Get centered. Always it starts with us, and it's the only thing we have any control over. Our own consciousness, our own centeredness. Also, with a thing that Master emphasized in this day, in this age, is community that not only finding God yourself, but finding God with others. And it's, I like to think of it as in Kali Yuga, we were all in caves. And so, uh, if we were, but it, you know, that's the way you had to follow the path was in the cave. And so often you'll find people, when they come to the spiritual path in this life, sometimes it'll be like, oh, gosh, if only I had known, I would have gotten the cave. Or where is the cave? Or I would like to go back to the cave. Or they say, I'm going on a pilgrimage to the Himalayas. And the family says, no way, because you might not come back. <laughs> so we've had to reassure certain family members that, no, these are round trip tickets. And you don't have to worry. And, and so, um, but the, uh, this sort of yearning for the cave is an old 
uh, way of being. It's this, in this Dwapara Yuga, we are, I mean, sorry, looking at Ashwini, I was thinking she was just in Badrinath, just returned. So you have sort of the aura of the cave, maybe that's part of what we're feeling. That we are living as yogis in the world. We are living as yogis among others. We have come out of the cave, but I like to think that maybe we haven't come far out of the cave in the sense that at least let's all be together because that is so helpful when you are uh, with others who see life the way you do, especially if it's true and beneficial, but in this case, yes. So therefore, that magnetism, when you have the whole world saying the opposite, that magnetism is strengthening. That yes, God first, yes, peace first, yes, kindness, and I have seen it, and I have felt it. As I said, we saw it and felt it all the time from Swamiji. He talked about feeling it from Master. You can feel it from Master in the recordings of his voice. They're so strengthening. And, but again, that's because of something in you that responds, something in you that resonates. That's the first thing, as I said. So also within the community at different times, um, as is sort of natural uh, throughout Ananda's history, people would come together and sort of discuss how do we get back to basics or how do we come back to our center. For example, um, at the very first Kriya, uh, Kriya Ban retreat, this was when people who had had Kriya initiation already came together and just meditated together, talked about Kriya. We have now Kriya Bon satsangs, Kriya Bon retreats, all these things, Kriya Bon classes. But there was a time when we had, or it was before my time, but there was the first. And Swamiji said at that time that the community has been working very well in developing businesses and expanding and building and all these, also reaching out to help new people. And he said, all of which are vital, but I feel that it's also important for us to emphasize the center, the center of our lives, the center of our community, each one of us, our own center, which is, he said, the search for God and Kriya. And I felt that it was the right time. Also, people were ready to uh, have such a retreat. And so that began that whole uh, wave of Kriya-related things. But again, knowing that because of this level of growth, now it was time to get back to center. So at another time in Ananda's history, a similar discussion people were having about how do we, you know, again, emphasize the basics. How do we put first things first? It's not as if anybody forgot, but these things are natural to reemphasize and also sort of think of in a new way. And somebody had the idea of, uh, approaching the, our spiritual life, of course, as disciples of Master, I already talked about the four meditation techniques, how to live, devotion to the Guru, there's a lot, attunement. But they said we can think of it in terms of the five S's, as they put it. And so one S is uh, sadhana, and that's what I've been talking about. And it's, it's the, I think it's capital S. When we, when we do our sadhana in any way, especially if your sadhana has been disrupted, it's the perfect time to just get back into it and adjust your expectations to be what you can do or what you can talk yourself into doing. And not sort of, you know, you know right, um, no, no, just here I am, God, and I'm going to do this for this many minutes, just starting out gently because... As, Ma as Swamiji said, quoting Master, the more you meditate, the more you want to meditate. It's that simple. It builds that thirst. Why? For one thing is, you know, we do all this thinking, all this planning, all this working out, all this staring at the wall. And then we do our meditation for even a few minutes and <sighs> suddenly that relief, that peace comes that we weren't getting from in all these other ways. And that instantly reignites the hunger for it. Do what works. The next S of these five S's was um, uh, satsang. That it's very important to have our own sadhana, our own meditation. It's also very important to mix with others. Remember, Master's statement, your spiritual progress is determined primarily by the company you keep. I mean, 
that almost seems unfair. I mean, what if I'm, you know, stranded on some desert island? It's like, too bad, you know, I guess it's you, the palm tree and the crabs. Good luck. <laughs> no, because uh, one disciple even asked him that. He said, sir, but what if I'm alone? And Master said, am I not always with you? So that gives us another aspect, satsang with the guru, keeping the company of the guru, remembering that he's right there, talking to him, listening to him. So it, it, you can do it on your own, but why? When you have this community, why? Why make it harder? As Swamiji said, the spiritual path is hard enough. As Sri Yukteswar said, the path of yoga is singular enough, difficult enough, he said, without teaching people to become cross-eyed, because it was this whole, do you look at the tip of the nose, and all, he was answering that question, so Nasi Kagram. Anyway, so we have each other. Let's take advantage of that. As Prasanna said at the, when we first were regathering after the pandemic, he said, it's so wonderful to feel everybody here together because he had been coming to the temple and you know we had been in the temple talking to the camera lens and hopefully <laughs> some of you but he said everybody brings their own light like a candle you can think of that image if you want everybody brings their own light of devotion for God but all the lights together then create this bright light and it's so true that that that's one great advantage we have in community that is beyond just personality, beyond just here are people who think the way I do, all of that has its place. But there's just a vibration. And feeling that, again, can be very nourishing. So sadhana, satsang. Another is seva, service. And in fact, those are that, that's in the discipleship vow. And Master said, if you want to be in tune with me, the temple blessing and all the different serving opportunities there will be and how it will go. Different ways, different ideas we can share and how to help because it will take the army. And if you're wondering where the army is, look around. <laughs> look in the mirror. We, we are the army. And so it'll be wonderful to have so many uh, family members from outside come and visit. And so what we want to do to make it special for them as they are making it special for us by their presence and their blessing. So, sadhana, satsang, seva. Another one is study. It's so important for us. We normally, swadhyaya is one of the niyamas. We normally explain swadhy swadhyaya as study of one's self. And that is actually the deeper meaning of it. In other words, introspection, analyzing ourselves, understanding ourselves, analyzing with a kindly eye, <laughs> but still trying to understand our own motivation. So study of yourself, because swa is self. But swadhyaya sometimes is translated as you have to study these things yourself, meaning do your own study of the scriptures and so on. And that's perfectly valid too. And that's more in the line of what this study was meaning. There is, I mean, unless we've read all 149 of Swamiji's books, there's probably more that we could read. And if we have, then we can start again at the beginning. Master's books, there's so much that we can dive into. And I will put a, a plug in that uh, as Darmini was mentioning last time about the essence of the Bhagavad Gita. It's uh, really, Master said millions will find God through his Bhagavad Gita commentary. He said not just hundreds or thousands, millions. I know, I have seen it. He said a new scripture is born when he finished it. And you can say, well, it's there, you know, I know where it is on the shelf, maybe even my own shelf. I, I look at it, I like the painting on the cover. <laughs> But you know, I mean, we waited 45 years for that book to come out because we knew Master had written it and it wasn't available. And then when Swamiji published it, we all grabbed it and, you know, finally we could read. What did Master say about the Gita? But Swamiji said, the autobiography of a yogi gives you the desire to seek God. And the Bhagavad Gita, this book, The Essence of the Bhagavad Gita, shows you how to do it. And so he said, the most important book I've written is that book. And often he would say that when he wrote a new book, but this time he said it and it stayed that way. He said, the most important book of ours is the essence of the Gita. He said, in fact, the most important aspect of Ananda's work 
At one point, he said, is the essence of the Bhagavad Gita book. Then comes communities, meditation, you know, all the things we were used to sort of defining ourselves as. So study. And you can also watch videos of Swamiji, you know, in other words, there are other ways you can study. But there's always more to learn. Even if you've seen the video a hundred times, it will speak to you in a different way. Speak to you in a way that you need. And, and uh, always keep our minds expanding, because we can get into sort of ruts. I know the path, this is how things are. Always studying some new statement of Master, some new fact, kind of keeps us awake, keeps us interested, keeps us going. Recently, someone was sharing, Master had said that reincarnation is actually an instrument of Maya. And I was shocked, because I grew up thinking there was no reincarnation, and you got one chance, and then, you know, good luck or not, just like the exams I took as a kid, and then that's it. And it didn't seem very fair, so when I learned you got multiple chances, I thought, well, that's very nice. It's very convenient. Thank you, God. So I thought reincarnation was an invention of God to say, try again, and no problem. But in fact, Master said it's a tool of Maya because at the end of, Maya always prevents it from their life from working out. And so we die at the end of life with the thought, ah, but next time I'm going to come back just once more and get that particular desire fulfilled. And that's what keeps us going. So... Interesting. But it's just something like that. Oh, you know, there's a different way of looking at things. And Master said so. Master said so. So study means Master's teachings. As Anantaji said wonderful, wonderfully, you know it's just like Master's teachings? Master's teachings. <laughs> so the last one of the five S's, uh, which Swami debated a little bit, <laughs> was Swami. <laughs> the last S was Swami. Our attunement with Master and the channel through whom Master has come to us, which is to say Swamiji. Everything is here because of Swamiji. And no one knows that better than Ananda Chennai. Because Swamiji came, he said there should be a center here, and then there was. That fast. Almost. It took us a few months to get here. But still, it was that short a time, and it happened. But only because he said so. Because of Chennai's interest. Again, coming back to interest, Chennai had 3,000 people at his talk. He said, we have to have a center. That's it. Many of you have heard that story recently, even from Jayaji on the video. So that we should always appreciate the, the channels through which these teachings have come and to try to attune ourselves in that way also. It, I find that people's success, comfort, Adananda, uh, very often correlates with their interest and openness to Swami Kriyananda and his teachings and his expression of the teachings. For some people, it's just sort of obvious. So, I mean, what do you mean? That's all I know, which is in fact true, meaning that it's all come through to, to us through him from Master. And so it makes things very easy and people grow very quickly. And so that Awareness. Swamiji said, well, let's, let's call it spiritual director <laughs> rather than Swami because he didn't, want, he didn't want the risk of people making it too personal. And so, of course, we can think of that too. In other words, our own spiritual family, Ananda specifically, what's happening right now in other centers, what's what are Jyotish and Deviji's new book, for example, A Touch of Divine Wisdom, getting that book, reading that book, attuning to God through Swamiji and through Master and through them and that expression of the things that they're sharing. Again, thinking of it as a channel for God. That's all that we're trying to do. It isn't about personality. Of course, Swamiji was perfectly correct. And yet, we can't help but honor, we have to honor that channel through which everything has come to us that's made all the difference in life. It's, for this, it has made my life worth living. It's made, given my life meaning. And it's helped me to smile and not just in a sarcastic way, which is more where the smiles were coming from before. Or if there was enough ice cream, there was a smile. But that's all outer stuff. So again, if any one of these five S's appeals to you, or if you heard one and said, gosh, I, I wasn't really thinking about that one, it might be worth exploring and thinking about how we can take ourselves deeper. And again, first things first always uh, is our duty to God, which is our duty to love God. Swamiji said that to me once when I met him for the first time and I said, I ha he said, how are you enjoying it here in Italy? Which Italy's beautiful, but with Swamiji there, it was 
you know, uh, the best place on earth. And so I, I said, I'm enjoying it very much, but I have a feeling that if I asked you if I could stay here, you would have me not, basically, <laughs> meaning go back to America. Because I already had, he'd already said, uh, you know, you should be a school teacher in California. So it was sort of determined, but just in case. Um, and he said, I agree with you. He said, your duty lies there. But then he said, your highest duty is to God, I grant you. But you can serve him while uh, serving there. But that your highest duty is to God, the first thing. Why? Because God loves you so much. And with God, everything works. God bless you.